Welcome back to Miller's Movers, episode five, where each week I take you through the weekend that's just been and take a look at the revised handicap marks, which get released every Tuesday morning. This week, we've also got a special guest view as we build up towards Cheltenham Festival for the next three, four weeks. We're going to have a special guest on trying to look at some different angles heading into the Cheltenham Festival. And I'm sure this week you won't be disappointed. But we'll start with the weekend that's just been. Lots of cancellations again because of the weather, but Newbury thankfully survived and put on some really competitive racing and some quite informative racing. Looking forward to the Champ Festival. There is only one place I want to start, and that is Shishkin, one of my favourite horses in training. It was just great to see him back to his best at Newbury, as I think he was in the, in the King George at Kempton, where I think he was pretty unfortunate not to land that prize. But he jumped well at Newbury, travelled happily enough. He started to become a bit lazy in his racing, sometimes gets a bit behind the bridle and he's encouraging a long bite, Nico de Bonville. But I don't mind that all that much in a, in a three-mile chase. An efficient way of racing is a good way of racing as far as I'm concerned when you're talking about stamina horses. His jumping was sound. He made a mistake at the cross fence first time and he was a bit fiddly at the last when on a tight stride. But he's, he's pretty quick with his feet and seems to know what he's doing. I was very taken by the comments from Connections afterwards. Um, Nicky Henderson said that he took a good blow after that, which is perhaps surprising when you think that you know he was pretty ready for, for Kempton and you'd expect that to have brought him forward. I wonder whether he lost a bit of time after Kempton because of that unseat. Like I mentioned at the time, I think the way he unseated and got his legs tangled, he was going to be a bit sore. So perhaps they had to hold fire for a bit before building him up for this at Newbury. The fact I think he took a good blow is a positive sign. There's more to come. And uh, Nico de Boinville sort of echoed that and said that he would come forward for the run. For my mind, 10 to 1 is a, is a big enough price to get me interested for the Gold Cup. Galloping de Champ, of course, sets a fearsome target. You know, he is the standout horse. But on raw ability, I think when you go through the field, for me, Shishkin is the only horse in that lineup that you could comfortably say potentially has the raw ability to be as good as Galloping de Champ. One slight niggle is whether Cheltenham is his track, which is perhaps a strange thing to say about a horse that won a Supreme and an Arkle, but he did bomb out badly in the champion chase and I know there was excuses found and he did look unhappy in the Ryanair last year it's clearly an intelligent thinking sort of horse as we saw at Ascot when he thought he didn't fancy racing on that occasion and I just wonder whether after sort of suffering that unhappy experience in the champion chase did he last year just remember his sort of uh, time from from the year before and just not feel all that comfortable on the track I hope I'm overthinking it and, and clutching at straws as I sometimes can do but for me Shishkin is a really exciting addition to the Gold Cup picture and at around about 10 to 1 I certainly want to put some money down and take my chance with him against the brilliant Galloping Deschamps. Edward Stone as well sort of rolled back the years a little bit changing tactics in the game spirit went to the front jumped with great speed great accuracy had the race run really down the back straight and certainly looked a better version of himself this year Personally, I don't want to get too carried away. I think the race did fall apart a little bit. Amarillo Sky, sadly, on his return, went lame on his right four, which was a reoccurrence of an injury that uh, stopped him in the Clarence House uh, last year. So that's lost an angle. And then Boot Hill was, he wasn't completely out of sight, but he'd already been exposed, I think, in handicap company before. So I'm not certain that the uh, form amounts to enough to, to really challenge the principles in the champion chase but he would certainly add an interesting aspect to it if he were to go there particularly if they can be encouraged connections to persist with this front running ride I was disappointed to see in the interview afterwards that Alan King sort of mused that maybe being that uh, aggressive in the champion chase wouldn't be the way to go for my money and I've trained far less winners than Alan King before anyone points that out if it isn't broke don't fix it and this this tactic clearly saw Everstone back to his best there's two very strong pieces of evidence from the Schlur chase and the Tinkle Creek that Edwardstone can't beat John Bon if he's ridden from behind. So for my money, you'd roll the dice and chance your arm out in front and, and let them come and pass you. The final big race of the day at Newbury was the Betfair hurdle. Delighted to see Ibirica Lord win, tipped on the SPK podcast on another Saturday where I just thought it was going to be a day where I rattled the crossbar a bit too much. But under a really nice patient ride from Nico de Boinville, he jumped really well up the home straight got to the front against a, a brave ride by Luce de Sud, um, but uh, one going away. I think this is the horse that's going to step up in trip and be seen to even better effect. 
The handicap has bumped him up nine pound this morning to a mark of 143. That gets him into both the Martin Pipe and it would likely get him into the into the Coral Cup as well. I almost would have preferred it if he'd have gone up £12 because that would have ruled out the Martin Pike. He would have been above the 145 threshold for that and I'd have been very comfortable having an anti-post bet for the Coral Cup. But given that he's got two options, uh, that slightly tempers my enthusiasm. And, and unlike in usual years, Nicky Henderson has got a very good conditional jockey in Freddie Gordon this year. It's always amazed me that for such a big yard, Nicky Henderson's never seemed to have a really top-notch conditional. I think this year he's got a very good conditional in Freddie. And so that might make the Martin Pipe more appealing but he does have a number of horses that i think uh, could be well suited by the martin pipe one of which we'll come on to later so for me at the moment it's a watching brief on iberica lord i'll be keen to keep him on side i think if he goes to, to cheltenham gets his conditions and goes up in trip off a new mark of 143 now we'll move on to the main part of this podcast which is the handicap movers and shakers uh, as ever if, you, if you're new to this the marks get released on a tuesday morning and we cover them in the old top of the pop style, horses going up, horses going down, new movers, uh, new entries and non-movers. There are no new entries this week that interest me, but quite a few non-movers, so we'll get to those in a minute. But we'll start with the horses going up. And the first one I want to talk about is Rocco Vango for Ollie Murphy. This horse had a very strange career. He started in Ireland with Michael Lynch, had three bumper runs and showed a decent level of form without winning. Uh, placed second on uh, one occasion, third on the other then moved across to the UK to the care of Ian Williams and had his sort of novice hurdle campaign. Again, ran well, notably at Haydock, went third behind Matata, who's now rated 138, and War Soldier, who won this weekend, actually is rated 122. He moved from Ian Williams back to Michael Lynch in Ireland and had one maiden run, didn't do all that much, and has then moved back across the sea again to Ollie Murphy. And he finished a strong second on handicap debut at Huntingdon last week, was off the bridle quite early, was only beaten a neck by Nordic Tiger. Now, Nordic Tiger had been very well placed by Harry Derham. He'd won a conditional rider's race the week before. He reappeared without a penalty because it was a conditional rider's race. So he was very well in. Rockavango ran him far closer than I think uh, Harry Derham would have expected. And I think going up in trip, Rockavango, off a mark now of 111, he's been bumped up just £2 for that run. Looks to me like a surefire future winner. Another horse that featured last week and uh, a trainer that's featured plenty this season is Herman Legree for Robbie Llewellyn. Uh, another feather in the cap for Robbie Llewellyn. This horse had 14 starts for Warren Great Tricks without winning, picked up for just 2,500 by connections through the summer. He would have won at Southern, as I pointed out last week, only to one seat two out and, uh, under Kaylin Quinn. Was turned out again quickly before his reassessed mark could take effect. So he ran off 78 uh, this week and absolutely bolted up over two mark three furlongs he's gone up another nine pound now but we essentially need to take that as a 14 pound rise if you can follow my mass at southerly ran off 78 he was up five pound for that but last week at hunted and he was able to race off 78 because the 83 didn't take effect so he's now nine pound on top of the 83 which is essentially a 14 pound rise but he's entered at fakenham on friday where he will run off 90 because he'll run off a £7 penalty on top of his markers of 83. I hope that makes sense. I thought £14 still looked workable. I think you have to take the form line from Huntington against the third horse because the runner-up was a fairly unexposed four-year-old. Wise Guy was in third. Now, Herm Legree beat him 10 lengths and was getting £17. He would only get £3 going forward, but the manner with which he won, he barely came off the bridle. The fact that I think he will improve for going up in trip means that off even a £14 hour mark, I think Herm Legree is still well handicapped and he is still £10 below the very original uh, handicap mark the handicapper gave him when he was in the care of Warren Greatrex. Now the handicapper can get it wrong, but very rarely does he get it wrong on an opening mark by £10. I spoke to Robbie Llewellyn this morning, told him what I thought of his mark and, and he wasn't in disagreement. He thinks there is still room to manoeuvre off this new mark and confirm that he was a very likely runner at Fakenham on Friday where he would essentially be £2 well in so maybe put him in your tracker and keep an eye out for him on Friday. Those are the horses going up we'll now move on to horses going down in the handicap and the first one I want to talk about is Orini Mill who ran in the Betfair hurdle for Victor Dartnell Alan Johns. I just happened to, to see after the race actually uh, an interview Luke Harvey did with uh, 
Alan Johns, as he was getting out of the car, sort of slightly uh, caught him unawares. He was really excited about the ride, but he did mention that the horse can be a little bit claustrophobic, can take a bit of time to warm up in his races. And I think that paid out in the in the Betfair hurdle itself. Uh, Aurigny Mill was quite well situated, quite far back, never really seemed to get into the race. And, and just simply in a race of this calibre, you cannot afford to be that far back and to forfeit ground early on. He was well beaten in, in, in the region of 60 lengths, but he has been dropped a pound. That in itself is nothing. But I do think if you look back at his previous win at Kempton, where he absolutely bolted up, a mark of 131, which he's on now, still looks workable. So keep an eye out for him in a competitive handicap, but a smaller runner field handicap where he can perhaps find a bit of uh, room early on, warm to his task. He might still be worth persisting with off a mark of 131. Now for a bit of a wild one. And uh, I can just imagine... Uh, host of the SBK podcast, Jess Stafford, shaking her head and muttering Mad Miller under her breath. But Mr. Coffey ran in the handicap chase at Newbury at the weekend and looked a bit moody, travelled very well into the home straight, jumped well bar a couple of mistakes. But as soon as he got challenged and was coming off second best, to me, he looked to down tools slightly. He does wear cheap pieces. He is a notoriously quirky character. But he got dropped £3 for that down to a mark of 138 and I can't shake from my mind the image of him absolutely sailing away at the front of the field in last year's Grand National, where he went off at a great pace, jumped brilliantly, looked to be loving the challenge, and ultimately didn't get home, which was not surprising off a very strong pace that he set. This mark of 138 would have seen him off 10 stone 9 in last year's Topham. Given that he appeared to love the fences at Aintree, I just wonder whether he might head that direction. And I wouldn't be surprised if he was to have a wind up or maybe a tongue tie fitted in the future. He did stop quite drastically and I just wonder whether something was slightly amiss. Although I should point out nothing was reported to the stewards. Now on to the non-movers, which is the biggest section of uh, handicap movers and shakers this week. And I'll try and rattle through these quite quickly. The first one is Thunder Rock. Trained by Ollie Murphy, a horse that I love, and I'm starting to get a bit of a better handle on him. I followed him last year blindly over a cliff. This year, I'm starting to pick away and understand what this horse wants. He won very nicely at Carlisle at the start of the season. I couldn't touch him in that competitive handicap at Cheltenham. I didn't think he was going to like the, the fierce pace and, and, and jumping at that pace, and that proved to be right. He ran much better at Musselburgh at the weekend, rallied on into, into second place, having got outpaced. Ollie Murphy had proved said that he doesn't see him as a three-miler, but I'm hoping on the evidence he saw at Musselboro, where he did some very good late work over two mile four and has seemed to get outpaced, that they might well give that a try. He stays on a mark of 146, and I think in a small field handicap, which he might well get now in and around the Cheltenham and Aintree festivals, you know, some of the weekend racing can be quite diluted because connections are targeting the bigger festivals. I think Thunder Rock might well be able to be found a winning opportunity over a handicap of three miles. The next horse on the list is an Alan King trained uh, novice hurdler in the form of Masaccio. This horse just looks incredibly well handicapped. He won at uh, a very short price at Kempton last week. I think it was one to six on one as the uh, market suggests he should. But it's his back form that really interests me. His mark stays unchanged on 129. He was beaten just nine lengths in the Chalo by Captain T, who's now rated 142. But even more interestingly, prior to that, he was beaten just a nose by Jinko Blue, who's now rated 138. And he was actually conceding weight to Jinko Blue. Alan King mentioned after Kempton that uh, they were perhaps gear up towards the grade one at Aintree. But I'm hoping he will have uh, opened his emails this morning, seen this revised mark or unrevised mark of 129. And that might just have tempted him into looking to a handicap uh, campaign through the spring. I think uh, Masaccio looks very well handicapped off 129. The downside of my weekend was undoubtedly my nap from the SBK podcast, which was uh, hashting for John Joe Neal and John Joe Neal Jr. Uh, very disappointing in the, in the novice hurdle at Newbury. Now, lots said about this ride on social media. I think you have to be very careful. The stewards didn't look into it for whatever reason. And I know that uh, when I get the inevitable tweets and, and messages in my inbox sort of uh, criticising my tipping, I can cope with that. But it's when people suggest that I'm working for a bookmaker or deliberately giving bad information to help a bookmaker, questioning my integrity that really uh, sort of grinds my gears and does sort of hit home a little bit. So I'm very 
wary of saying that this was a ride that wasn't uh, given to best effect. But regardless, I think this was a very poor ride. He was spotting the leaders 15 lengths when he was dropping back from two mile three at Catrick to two miles. Never really given a chance to, to, to get back to a, to a front runner that, that went off the front. Uh, his mark stays unchanged on 119. He didn't jump well at Newbury, but I do feel that, that was perhaps down to the lack of revs that were sort of injected into the race. Um, Hashtink still remains on my radar for mark of 119. Maybe the EBF final, but certainly a handicap in the spring looks right off a mark of 119. And then the final one for this week is the Nicky Henderson train, Dolly the Great, who I think might be an interesting horse going forward into the spring festivals, maybe the Martin Pipe. He stays on 132 after rallying into fourth in the Betfair hurdle. He hung quite badly left up the home straight at Newbury under pressure from James Bowen. And that did mean that he got caught on heels of the weakening Donica at about two out. Made very good late progress to finish fourth. He was beaten just eight and a half lengths. He would get a nine pound pull with Iberico Lord. I think Iberico Lord is interesting going up in trip. And I think Doddy the Great is also of huge interest going up in trip, given he has already won over two and a half miles albeit in a fairly modest novice hurdle last season. So that's the handicap moves and shakers. Now for something a little bit extra as we build in towards the Cheltenham Festival. I wanted to try and get some outside opinions. I think it's really important that uh, you understand your areas of expertise and what you're not so expert in and try and seek out expert opinions to, to build into your picture as we head towards the Cheltenham Festival and indeed the entry festival and punchestown festival further on into the spring so we're gonna have a couple of special guests each week this week it's adam mills you will know him on social media as gg banker and if you don't know his name you will certainly recognize his immaculate handwriting he produced these beautiful spreadsheets with his uh, speed figures and his data always immaculately laid out i'm very jealous of it so adam thanks very much for joining us let's not mess around let's get straight into the french angle um I mean, first question really is, are there any French Raiders? Obviously, Thelem was, uh, I think you were quite keen on him for the, for the stay, as I certainly was. He's uh, not going to come. And I think we ought to point out that I think he's still in the entries. I think they, they forgot to take him out. So he still is in the entries, but he isn't coming. He is injured. Won't come to Cheltenham. Are there any other French Raiders we should be looking out for? Not not really. If you go through the anti-post markets, there are a few French names in there. But I've, I've looked through and now that Thelem isn't coming... I can't imagine there's going to be a French runner. Ile Francais is the obvious one. If he were to run in the Turners, he'd probably be favourite. Um, but I think you have to understand that Noel George and Amanda Zetholm are French-based trainers. And if you had a choice between winning a Turners or winning a Grand Steeplechase to Paris, you'd want to win the Grand Steeplechase, not more, more so than anything, because the Turners is £98,000 to the winner, so about €115,000. The Grand Steeplechase to Paris is €405,000. It's a no-brainer, really. And ultimately, French steeplechasing, because so many talented horses are taken out of the pool and sold as younger, When you, by the time you get to the sort of grade one chases for the older horses, it's a pretty weak pool. And I would imagine he is, if there was an anti-post market, he'd probably be the evens favourite for it. And they've got plenty of time. He's only a six-year-old. You could win the Grand Steeplechase to Paris maybe pick up a King George and then have a go next year. So I don't think he'll run. There's, there was actually a Potemps qualifier runner or toy. No one knows about it. And if you go on the official site for the Potemps series, it's not even on there. But on France Gallup, it's listed as a Potemps qualifier. So we'll go with it. The winner is a horse called Captain, trained by Rod Collet. He's the only one of the four who would get in. He's got an official rating, the equivalent to 138. I can't confirm or deny whether he's going to run. I haven't been able to get any concrete from the connections, but... I don't think he'll run. And even if he does, I think he'd be absolutely taken off his feet. He's a lovely horse, but Auto is his track. That's where he's going to go. There are two in the cross country. French horses have traditionally done quite well in the cross country. Obviously, everyone remembers Easy's Land, but there was also a really good horse called Urgent de Gregain, who chased home Tiger Roll a couple of times. He's got, he had lots of nice form. There are a couple in the cross country betting, the Saint Godefroy and Hip Hop Conti, who are the best cross country horses in France. But all of their form is at Poe in the winter. And ultimately, both of them in a handicap would be rated in the high 120s. So in the nicest way, what's the point? I think the French connections look at the cross country as it is now and think, yes, we could have a runner at Cheltenham for the sake of it. But 
if we're going to bump into Delta Work, Galvin, Manila, Indo, you know, we're going to have to run 30, 40 pounds higher than we would normally run to win a big pot in France. What's the point? So sadly, I think in the absence of Philem, we are not going to have a French runner this year. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great shame, isn't it? Because it certainly adds something to the to the festival. Like you say, hopefully LA Francais might come back and uh, raid next year and, and add an extra dimension potentially to the Gold Cup, I imagine. One race that French form definitely has a bearing on and has had a bearing on for a number of years is the Triumph Hurdle. I know you've got an excellent record in finding the winner of the Triumph. Um, talk us through it. Obviously, the Spring the spring Juvenile at Leopardstown, Cargis, Stormheart, Marjborough, Bunting, Carla Conti, all raced in France, as did Antipost favourite and, and to my mind, the most likely winner, Sergino. Uh, what have you made of them? What do you make of their French form? What have you made of them since they've come over? Have the sort of French form got turned on its head in terms of trainers finding improvement or has it gone as you expect it to? It's mostly gone as I would expect it to. Sergino won the pre-wild monarch, which is sort of one of the key three-year-old newcomers races. And he beat Salvatore Mundi who is with Willie Mullins. I don't think we're going to see Salvatore Mundi now. It looks like they're going to save him for a novice campaign. Those two were miles clear of the rest. There's been several winners come out of that race. What was most noticeable about Sergino's win in France was, if you imagine a race at Autoy, the stand side rail has an enormous bias. They can't seem to do anything about it. And if you watch that race in running, Salvatore Mundi comes alongside Sergino and he's got the rail. And in nine times out of 10, that would be enough to win the race. But Sergino just picks him up, comes comes outside him and wins easily. The time was really good. He went to Nicky Henderson. I have to say, when I, I was away over Christmas, so I sort of caught up with him when I got back. When I saw his Kempton run, I was a bit underwhelmed. He made a couple of sort of very novice mistakes, left his back legs in one in the home straight. And at that stage, I was thinking, oh, maybe he's just a bit forward and they'll catch him. But the more I looked at it and the way that race was working out, he beat Burdett Road so easily. And at Christmas, there's a couple of people who I'll privately message when it doesn't happen. Two people messaged me and said, Burdett Road is a certainty for the triumph. Your French lads have got no chance. Now, that, if that was accurate, then Sergino has kicked him out of the way. The only thing I would say if you want to take on Sergino is Sergino was wonderful at Cheltenham. But if you look at the horse in third, that's Milan Tino, who's J.P. McManus's horse with Noel George and Amanda Zettel. He's a very consistent horse, but he's just not quick enough to win a juvenile hurdle. But he always runs to about 130. That's his level at the moment. If you assume that he ran to 130, Badette Road was seven lengths in front of him in November, and he was only one length in front of him in January. So there is a small case to say maybe Badette Road was slightly under par, which made Sergino look better. But that being said, Sergino's clearly improving. I think Badette Road has reached his level. Sergino must be 1 to 10 to finish in front of Badette Road. So Sergino sets a fair standard. When we came to the, the spring juvenile, I felt I still haven't made up my mind. This was either a brilliant spring juvenile with five or six great horses all in contention at the second last. Or it was a pretty average spring juvenile and it just came that experience came to the fore and what makes me sort of lean towards the latter is the first two home were Carguess and Stormheart. Carguess was having her fifth run over hurdles. Stormheart had five runs in the flat on the flat in France before he joined Willie Mullin. So their experience seemed to come to the fore in the closing stages. They knew what to do. If you've backed the likes of Bunting or Majbra each way, particularly Majbra. He's the one probably to take on his second start. I think that was a big run. But I, on my figures, I'd probably have Sergino 10 pounds clear. And he's only had three starts, so you've got to think he's going to improve again. I think the way I would analyse it now is Carges and Majbra, and maybe even Bunting, you know, there might be an each way angle with them. But do you want to have an each way bet where the horse could run the best race of its life and still get beat? And that's what I think would happen. Carguess gets seven pounds as a filly. Madra will obviously improve. Bunting will improve. But ultimately, they could run a career best and they're still behind Sergino. And I don't really want to have another bet where I'm thinking Sergino's got to underperform. He is the, He's about an even money shot there or thereabouts. I think that's perfectly fair because I think if he ran it 10 times, he'd win five of them. But what I would say is in two years' time, I think Madra will have caught up because that was an enormous run on just his second start. 
Yeah, Masbury really caught the eye walking around the paddock as well, didn't he? I know Willie Mullins sort of made no uh, sort of bones about the the great physical specimen he is. Um, I think what people slightly forget as well is because it hasn't happened in recent years is Nicky Henderson loves having a juvenile. And of course, what we don't need reminding about is that when it comes to Cheltenham, there is no finer trainer at getting a horse ready for Cheltenham in March. Um, that's really interesting. Moving on, um, Willie Mullins often talks about giving these French horses a bit of time to find their feet and to acclimatise. I certainly found that with with sports horses. You know, we occasionally get a few across from France, and they definitely just took a bit of time to not necessarily perform, but to look right because our hay is different, our feed is different. Um, Gaelic Warrior was the one that sprang to mind. Really, you know, rocked up to the to the uh, Fred Winter off a mark of 129 and got beaten through the race away, possibly. But he was clearly well handicapped because he then won a Leopardstown handicap off 143 and just a year later arrived at the Chartman Festival for the Ballymore off a mark of 157. So there's clearly a huge amount of improvement found by Willie Mullins and perhaps for that extra bit of time to acclimatise. Are there any horses coming into this festival, perhaps juveniles from last year or elsewhere, that you think showed form in France they haven't yet shown in the UK that you hope they might show? Uh, this season and is there anything else from the from the sort of French knowledge you have that really interests you for the festival the, there's a few that that interest me I mean I, I must admit I don't spend as much time as I used to looking at the Irish and British novice hurdles so I come to it a bit fresh with only really my French arsenal in the pocket to know what I'm looking for but there are a few angles that I thought were sort of interesting the first would be in the supreme I assume Mr Giff is going to run in the Supreme. He's probably going to be a Willie Mullins outsider, but there's a great stat that came out of some of the research I did with Jake Price, which was Willie Mullins has ran 15 French horses in the Supreme in the last 10 years, but only four of those 15 ever jumped a hurdle in France competitively. And those four were Vatour, Duvan, Min and Classical Dream. Now it may be just an anomaly with the data, but what I actually like when I'm looking at the French horses is if they've jumped hurdles in France, that means they probably spent a good year schooling. A lot of the French trainers will start doing some basic schooling as two-year-olds. That gives a nice angle. Now, Mr. Giff has probably got to go some to challenge the likes of Bally Burn. But I think sometimes people will look at the form and think, oh, he's only had a couple of a run or two for Willie Mullins. But what you need to look at is think, how much time has this horse spent practising being a hurdler? Mr. Giff's got loads of experience from the flat. He's also jumped hurdles in France. If you wanted to have a big outsider for the Supreme, I think that's an angle you can exploit because what he has got is race experience. And in a race like the Supreme, I like the fact that I want them to be quite sound jumpers because they're going to be put under pressure at speed. That was one angle that I thought was worth exploiting. The second one that I wanted to really highlight is one that I think is being underplayed, and that's the performance of a horse called Hartwood for Henry de Bromhead. Now, he absolutely bolted up at the DRF. He's got a £12 rise for winning that handicap chase. But I think for anyone to assume that that's the end of his progression would be madness. He was an exceedingly good hurdler in France, and he just reminds me so much of Aplutard. He's got that exact kind of profile that we're looking for. I had to go back through the form. They tried him in a grade one as a juvenile. He was sixth in the pre canvas series, which is the grade one. It's kind of, I guess you'd call it the French triumph hurdle if you wanted to, to pigeonhole it. But what's most significant is his last run in France was a win in March 2022 in a handicap. He carried top weight at Autoy to win that handicap, giving seven pounds or more to the rest of the field. I'll quickly run through it. The second, Maria Costala, is now a listed winner rated £12 higher. The third was Tempo de Martin, who won his next two starts, both in listed company, £17 higher. The fourth was listed place, is now £5 higher. The fifth won twice over fences that season. The seventh one later in the season is £5 higher. The eighth won a handicap in his listed place. The ninth and tenth both won handicaps that year. If I could have a time machine and go back, I'd just follow that form and I'd be retired by now. But... What I would think is that kind of performance would suggest that this horse is on a massively upward curve. They sent him over fences, a couple of educational runs, shall we say, and then he's gone into a handicap of one. Now, at the moment, he's the favourite for the plate. If the UK handicapper takes his Irish mark of 148, I'd imagine he's going to get 152, 153, probably be top weight. I would definitely back him as top weight in the plate. But I also think connections must surely look 
at those grade ones, the turnovers, or even if they're really ballsy, the Ryanair, because both of those races look more than winnable. Whatever race he turns up in, I think within a year he'll be a grade one horse. And I think going back to the, the grounding he had in France, the experience in all those hurdles will play massively in his favour. He's one that's definitely on my radar. Another that was on my radar before Willie Mullins opened his big mouth was Sir Sama Jest, but I think that, that's gone, so we'll let that one go. But I'll give you another one who might sneak under the radar, and that's a horse called Jigoro, trained by Gordon Elliott. Comes from the family of Easy Work, who Elliott actually trained to be second to Envoy Allen in the Ballymore five years ago. He had one run in France when he was second in an AQPS flat race at Liniers. And the race was won by Jasco de Dames, who's now with um, Henry de Bromet, the third one next time. It's quite a good grounding in a sort of three-year-old bumper. He's then won his second start for, for Elliot at Navan. He was then second to Mystical Power in the Moscow Flyer. But what I thought was interesting about this horse was he's actually got a rating of 141, but he's entered at Kelso this weekend. Now, I'm not sure if they're going to run at Kelso, if this was just a feeler to see what the British Handicapper would do. But the fact they've put him in at Kelso, I think it's on Friday, would suggest to me that they think maybe we could sneak the Martin Pike with this horse. And he's another one who comes from a really nice AQPS family. I think he's going to go under the radar because everyone's looking at mystical power and thinking how sexy that horse looks. Jigoro was the one that I was watching thinking he's been given the nice education here and he could come on perfectly. Those were sort of the two obvious ones, I think, in terms of their price. I wanted to give you another couple of angles that I thought with the French form was interesting. And the first is a horse who I am always going to be in love with and I will never abandon. And that's Quilixios, who is the first Triumph Hurdle winner that I ever tipped. But what I would think is massively important for Quilixios is the angles being missed here. Now that Marine Nationale has been proved not to be bomb-proof, this arcle is wide open. And if you're looking for a horse who's done it over two miles, who's got plenty of speed and his two wins of, of over fence have both come at two miles, that's Colixios. And I was really impressed by his win in January. Everyone was picking holes in poor old Mr. Policeman, but actually Colixios put in a great performance. But where I think there's an angle with Colixios is there is an assumption that Triumph Hurdle winners are really forward and their form tails off the older they get. And if you go back through the data, you could definitely argue that with the likes of Peace and Co, probably Pentland Hills, a few others. But what's significant about Calixios is he missed a year with injury. So that actually, although you may not see an injury as a positive thing, having a year off gave him time to reset. And it's important to remember that Calixios won his three-year-old hurdle in, in March 2020, won the pre-decider Poulain, which is the very first three-year-old hurdle of the season. It was also the only three-year-old for Colts and Geldings run before racing was abandoned due to COVID. So part of the reason he, run the he won the triumph was that he had a normal season. But what's most important about him is he won that three-year-old hurdle two weeks before his third birthday. So he was still not actually three years old at the point he won that. So having that year off has given him time to mature. I've been so impressed with him in his two wins this season. I can't believe he's a double-figure price for the Arkle. I think there's a definite angle to exploit there because I think people are assuming he's a triumph hurdle winner and his best days are gone. I think he's coming to his best days. and I think he'll show that in March. The other brief point I wanted to touch on was Irish Point. He's the pretty much the anti-post favourite for the Stayers Hurdle. I've just about got over my disappointment of Falem not running, but I will probably tweet in March, Falem would have won that easily, regardless of how the race works out. But now I'm getting over it. I'm starting to look at the Stayers Hurdle. And what a sorry bunch this looks. I just can't, if as much as we love these veterans and these older horses, and the Cleave Hurdle was a great watch. My goodness, look at the state of this field. If if we're really looking at these kind of 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds as, as Stayers Hurdle contenders, I'm happy to take on T. Hooper because I don't think the ground will suit him. So that brought me to Irish Point. And there's lots of people saying there's doubts over his stamina. The Leopardstown race was run at a messy pace. We don't know he'll stay. I have no doubts about it at all. He comes through that graded AQPS field in France, which... People make the assumption they're national home flat races, which they're similar, but they're not the same because they're limited to AQPS breeds. And a lot of horses end up in those races where they're just trying to give them an education. But what you always get is big fields. He ran in the big grade one that he won at Song Clue. I mean, he beat Ilé Francais. 
Ile Francais is a monster of a horse. So that even that form alone points to me that this thing's got a bit of class. I love the way he hits the line. I've got no doubts about Irish Point staying three miles. I think there's a very good chance he might just be a class above most of the field in the stayers. But if you've got any, if you're holding back on backing him because you think he won't stay three miles, I I have no doubts whatsoever. Those big field races require stamina. They run them on bottomless ground at the end of the season. There's no problems with him staying at all. There, those were most of my angles. I wanted to give you one from massively left field, who I think is just being completely ignored, and that's a horse called Sons Brute. He won six times for David Cotan in France. Very talented horse, though. He's a bit quirky. He is a bit quirky. He's a little bit nuts, and very occasionally throws his toys out the pram. Now, if we take some of his form literally, he finished seventh in the French champion hurdle last year. That's a very good run against horses who were probably above his class. But he finished ahead of Horton Colours. He finished ahead of Flooring Porter. He's ahead of a steering for Lange. Somehow, he's ended up with Paul Nichols, and he's ended up with a French rating of 67 kilos, which meant he made his debut for Paul Nichols on a mark of 134. This is a horse who finished not that far behind some decent grade one stayers. He's got a mark of 134. His season start has fallen apart because they wanted to run him at Sandown in January on the veterans' final day. That meeting was abandoned, so they had to reroute him to Doncaster. On a mark of 134, Bryony rode him. She decided to try and lead because he was just too keen, which he can be. There are days when he just decides he's in charge. He was far too keen, pulled away his chance. He finished seventh. The handicap has given him two pounds back to 132. But the point I just want to make is that isn't son, the real Sons Brew. What he needs is a big field, plenty of cover, where he can't, if he can settle, he's got a lightning turn of foot. He's really dangerous. He will stay. Now, the problem they may have now is he's got a mark of 132. I've seen he's in the betting for the Coral Cup. I think he's in the betting for the Martin Pipe as well. Will he get into those races on 132? Touch and go, probably. So he's the kind of horse I've got on my radar that I thought, if they entered him in something like the Moor battle or they found a handicap hurdle between now and Cheltenham, I might have a little bit of a sort of non-runner, no bet approach to him that rather than back him in a Moor battle hurdle wherever he goes, he's the kind of horse I think if they get him right, he's going to be miles better than that mark. And you could have a non-runner, no bet because if he's too keen and pulls his chance away, he won't get in the race anyway. And then finally, before we go, there's one question which I thought was uh, an important one to answer. Andrew asked about collateral form and how that works. I mentioned it last week on a racing TV tip for handstands in the Sydney Banks last week. And I pointed out that uh, the Racing Post had him rated 131 on the race card. And in fact, he was actually rated 134 because he'd been revised by the handicapper stood in his stable. A couple of people were a bit confused by that, asked how it worked. And essentially, collateral form means that the handicapper can adjust any horse, theoretically, up or down. And I'm yet to see a horse get dropped for collateral form. I'm sure it has happened, but I've not noticed it. So Handstands won at Newcastle on his penultimate start, beat a horse called Tara's Hall, was given a mark of 131. But between Handstands running at Newcastle and reappearing at uh, Huntington for the Sydney Banks, Tara's Hall had come out the week before that and finished very well into second place at Doncaster, the handicapper adjusted Tara's hallmark and then went back and collateral form adjusted the mark of handstands. So for standing in his box, uh, handstands went up. I think it was actually £4 from 131 to 135 I do know it is one of the two big bugbears trainers have about handicap marks. They don't like getting raised in the handicap when they've uh, unseated or fallen two out or, or at the last. And they certainly don't enjoy getting collateral form rises doesn't happen all that much. It does, to me, seem a little unfair, but it's something that's worth being aware of. If you've found a form line that you think is very strong and you're delighted to see that the second horse has since gone out and boosted that form line, it is always worth just checking that the handicapper hasn't noticed as well and hasn't adjusted the mark that you thought was very lenient to a mark that now might not be quite so lenient. So that's it for episode five of Miller's Movers. I hope you enjoyed it. Personally, I thought Adam was brilliant with some really nice left field ideas and some really good explanations of his thinking re-French form. 
If you've got any questions, you can direct them to him on social media. If you've got any questions about handicap moving and shaking, how the handicaps work, please direct them my way and we'll deal with them next week where hopefully we'll have another special guest. <laughs>